Hello, my name is Brendan Barrett. I'm a research scientist at the Max Planck Institute for Animal Behavior. And today I'm going to talk about some of our long-term research on social learning, cultural traditions, and innovation at Lomas Barbadol. Now, social learning and behavioral traditions have been central to the history of Lomas's research program. At the turn of the millennium, the use of the group contrast method, so comparing differences between groups at Lomas and also between different capuchin sites in Northwest uh, Costa Rica, like Palo Verde, Curu, and Santa Rosa was essential to identifying the presence and absence of plausible behavioral traditions that were not explained by genes or ecological condition, conditions. And now we're moving on to questions about the origins and transmission and maintenance of these cultural traditions. And in the beginning, uh, many of these behaviors that are behavioral traditions are things like social conventions, like eye poking games, finger and mouth games, these bond testing rituals, and a lot of socially learned extractive foraging techniques they use as destructive foragers and ecological generalists. Now, LOMAS has a lot of advantages to studying social learning and culture. Um, one is that it's a longitudinal project, so we can track changes over the lifetime of an individual with great demographic, um, genetic, and group membership detail. We can capture rare events of biological importance, like migration and dispersal and group fissions and fusions. And capturing these rare events, since we track multiple groups, we can track an individual as it moves from group to group. And it also provides a lot of unique opportunities for naturalistic experiments that you can only get with multi-site long-term sites. And today we're going to break this talk up into three parts. First, we'll talk about the origin of cultural traditions, looking at studies of innovation. Then we'll look at experimental approaches, so looking at the cultural transmission of extractive foraging techniques. And then lastly, we'll talk about longitudinal studies of social learning strategies over the lifespan of a capuchin. And this first research project was done in collaboration with Susan and Irene, who are both here today as part of the symposium. And we're trying to understand how innovations arise in capuchin populations. So if you look at previous studies of innovation, there's really little long-term systematic study. Oftentimes there's post hoc comparisons of successful innovations on um, the things that you see spreading. But I think it's also really important to understand these neutral processes in evolutionary biology. Um, controlled experiments on innovations were often focused on goal-oriented aspects, but oftentimes these behaviors may have no clear initial adaptive benefit like eye poking. They may be really common and they may only arise endogenously in social groups um, in the wild. So it's really important to study who innovates what to inform how cultural variation is introduced and how or if behavior spread through populations. And our aims in the study were to one, document the variety of behaviors present in the capuchin repertoire, ask if differences in innovations rates exist across behavioral domains and what individual features predict these differences in innovation rates across domains. And lastly, what extent do these innovations become established components of individual or group specific behavioral repertoires? And in the study design, we recorded 10 years of innovative behaviors during focal follows and ad libitum. We extracted innovation data from the second half of the data, and in the first five years of the data, we used it as a buffer period to reduce false positives. So to qualify as an innovation in our data set, um, it had to be excluded from the buffer period or buffered period or not observed in a group in an individual's lifetime. And we split these behaviors into four domains. Foraging behaviors, things like um, wrapping caterpillars and leaves to process them and avoid the sting. Self-directed behaviorals, behaviors like postural quirks, individuals holding body parts for hours at a time in intergroup conflicts. Um, investigative behaviors, grooming a porcupine that spread through groups and social behaviors. So these dyadic bond testing rituals like hand sniffing and eye poking. And what we found is that five years of data yielded 187 innovations. About 80% of them were never seen again, performed by the innovator, about 22% plausibly spread. And we saw an estimate about two to six innovations per group per year. And since we're interested in innovation rates and how that relates to age, we estimate innovation rates on an annual scale. So here we can look at um, what properties of individuals predict innovation rates across behavioral domains. So we see if we look at sociality, less social individuals are more innovative in the foraging, investigative, and self-directed domain. We see the strongest effect in these self-directed domain. And a lot of these behaviors are self-soothing behaviors and solo play, oftentimes stereotyped appearing behaviors. Maybe this is kind of a cost of being a social um, 
or you know not having social interactions as much as others or due to not having access to other social information to acquire different things. So you develop more quirks. Um, and these investigative and forging innovations may also be a project of being less distracted by social life. You can explore the environment more. If we look at age, younger capuchins are more innovative in the foraging, investigative, and self-directed domains. And this makes sense. Um, oftentimes, the extended juvenile period of capuchins and other primates like humans may afford more opportunities for exploration. This brings up the question. So do behaviors be retained by juveniles? Do they have more opportunity to persist and spread in a population over an invader's lifetime? Um, and oftentimes, if we look at the social behaviors, Social behaviors making sense as individuals get older makes a lot of tense, makes a lot of sense, um, especially as these are bond testing rituals and coalitions and dyadic relationships become increasingly important to males and females with age. One of the take homes of the study is that when you have longitudinal data that's methodically collected intentionally to study innovation with really high but within group densities, you render fewer behaviors as plausible innovation. So there's a really high false positive rate. Um, so I think that short-term studies overestimate innovation. And um, if we eliminated our buff buffer period, we increased our number of innovations by about 52%, even though we used a hardline definition of innovation. And next, we'll move on to the mechanisms that spread cultural traditions um, using experiments. And this work was done in collaboration with Susan and Richard McElrath, now at the Max Planck Institute for Evolutionary Anthropology. And we focused on one particular extractive foraging behavior, Panama processing. So um, Panama processing techniques differ between groups. They're trying to get these black seeds out of this fruit that's structurally protected by myriad defenses. It generates really high levels of close range focused observation or peering. And these behaviors are interesting in that they differ in payoff, both in efficiency and efficacy. If an individual can open a fruit, it can take anywhere from two seconds to 45 minutes. One of the advantages of working at a long-term field site is you can take, um, take advantage of these opportunities for naturalistic experiments. So one group, Flake's group, fissions from the original study group in Lomas around 2001. Um, they migrated from an in intact tropical dry forest in blue to this other habitat of fragmented riparian oak corridor, and that this corridor lacked Panama trees. So as a consequence, we had five knowledgeable adults from different natal groups who differed in known processing techniques and about 20 in inexperienced adults and juveniles. So this was an ideal opportunity to document how inexperienced individuals acquire and develop a natural behavior in the wild when exposed to multiple knowledgeable tutors who differ in behavior. And to analyze this data, um, I developed a suite of experience-weighted attraction models. These were originally developed in the experimental behavioral economics literature and also used in cultural evolution literature. So what these do is these translate mathematical models of social learning, social learning strategies, which are kind of a pop bio style recursive equations that in, inform what information or who individuals copy and how that affects the behavioral phenotype. Um, if the advantages of these strategies or this statistical approach is it closely links theoretical models to data, or statistical models we use to analyze data. It permits the evaluation of the influence of multiple plausible learning strategies, and it combines an individual learning reinforcement model with social learning, the combination of the two which makes learning adaptive. And they're really um, modified to be uh, hierarchical. You can evaluate the, per the individual heterogeneity and its contribution to population level cultural dynamics. What we found, if you look at plots of raw data, we see each row, of this, each row in this plot is a monkey. Oldest monkey's at the top, youngest is the bottom. We look at each experimental day. The most successful technique in red went from being rarest to most common in the population. And we see that all individuals born after 2009 tried this behavior. And we also see that knowledgeable individuals switched behavior. And here is the uh, innovator, Napoleon, using this canine seam technique. And it also spread to younger, about five-year-old um, sub-adult males. And if we look at the results of the parameters from the model, we see that payoff bias learning, copying the most successful behavior, had the biggest contribution in predicting behavior. We also saw some support for negative frequency dependence and age bias, which makes sense. Um, the highest payoff behavior was initially the rarest, and older monkeys could only do this behavior probably because of size um, and strength constraints. So we get predictors of the parameters in this model. We see that older in individuals are less influenced by social information, and older individuals are also influenced less by recent experiences. They rely on distant memories more. 
The cool thing about these models is they can spit out multinomial predictions of the time series of behavior. So here we have the population mean of this uh, high payoff behavior in red spreading through the population. Look at model predictions for the innovator in the group. And here's a sub-adult and an adult female who switched to the high payoff behavior. MX was a naive individual and Need was a knowledgeable individual who switched behaviors. And one of the important take homes of this is that we see that inference at the individual level shows considerable variation and that these population level dynamics of culture do not reflect all individuals and they also have a lot of inferential limits. Now I'll move on to looking in the outside an experimental approach to social learning, looking at a longitudinal study of social learning strategies over the lifespan across multiple groups. Now, I think life history and cultural evolution, social learning is kind of one of the most exciting emerging fields um, in cultural evolution. And a slow life history and an extended juvenile period is often given as a reason in human evolution for why complex culture um, is adapted in dealing with environmental change. But while we saw in the last studies that innovation rate changes with age, can we actually see if different aspects of learning or social learning strategies used change with age as well? And can we track this in individuals over their lifetime? Because cross sections of behavioral data may show this pattern, but it may not be a product within an individual. So we need longitudinal data. And to focus on this, we looked at Sloania terniflora food processing techniques. Um, so Sloania is a structurally protected fruit. It's almost 40% of capuchin diet in the dry season. And capuchins will scrub or remove these irritating hairs using one of six behaviors on the outside of the fruit. And these behaviors do not differ in efficiency, unlike Panama. Cool thing about this data set is it's 10 years of data collected in 10 groups, about 228 individuals, almost 18,000 observations. Um, we also have in this data set 65 male migrations and seven group fissions in groups of varying size. And if we look at, we use another suite of experience weighted attraction models. If we look at the parameter estimates, we can see that yes, um, learning does change over the lifetime. For example, we see reduced weight given to social information with increasing age. And each of these red segments is a unique per monkey prediction. Um, and this is in agreement with recent theoretical models suggesting that um, longer lived organisms should rely more on social learning as juveniles. If we look at predictions for social learning strategies, we do see changes in the social learning strategies and cues used over age. We see an increasing reliance of kin bias with age, a reduced reliance on age biased copying older individuals and cohort biased copying similarly aged individuals. Um, these change with age as well. This brings up a couple of questions that we need to address. One, is this increased reliance on kin bias a consequence of changing social networks over time? Or are you seeing more bias towards social interactions with kin or are the kin networks becoming more important with age? Um, and is this decreasing reliance on age and cohort bias adaptive? Is there, a reason we could, is there a reason that theory would predict for these things to be adaptive as juveniles, but not as adults? Or is it simply a consequence of demographic change? Um, for example, as you get older, older monkeys die, your age mates are likely to die, and this could just be a signal of that, and that's something we need to tease apart. And then some future directions we hope to go with this data is to ask, how do migrations and group fissions affect cultural change and cultural variability in the population? And I think um, a method that's really needed for observational data and modeling and dynamic modeling of learning strategies is continuous time dynamic modeling. And this will be really useful for instances where we have gaps in data collection or don't have complete um, missions. And with that, I'd like to thank our funding sources, um, the government authorities at Costa Rica, all the field researchers, who, field researchers who collected data for this project, the field managers at LOMAS and our database management. And thank you.